First of all, I would like to take the lead for the first uh, few seconds. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear professors and uh, panelists and the colleagues, uh, it is a great honor for me tonight to introduce uh, all the panelists uh, tonight, uh, but I will leave them to uh, our uh, moderator, uh, Dr. Rabab Safwat, from an anesthesiologist from, uh, originally from Alexandria, but she's working now in, uh, in London. And uh, another uh, moderator, which is great honor to have here tonight for the first time, uh, Dr. Salam uh, Mishrofa. Uh, she's working in Qatar Hamad, uh, Hamad Medical Corporation as a straight consultant of anesthesiology. Uh, uh, it is a great honor to have both of them on board tonight to be moderator for this session. And uh, all yours, Dr. Abab and Dr. Salam. Thank you. Uh, dear panelists and attendees, welcome to the uh, MEGA online anesthesiology course on its eighth session in uh, 2021. Uh, tonight is really exceptional, and that's because we've got the experts on board. Um, they will share their knowledge and experience in the fields of intensive care medicine, anesthesia, and pain. Uh, but before we start, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Professor, uh, Professor Saad Mahdi and his team uh, for the uh, outstanding effort uh, behind this distinguished course. And it's always an honor for me to join the team. Uh, tonight, on the speaker's side, uh, our eminent guests, uh, Professor Samir Al Ansari, Dr. Mohammed Wahba, and Professor uh, Meghid Al Ansari. On the moderator side, myself, Rabab Ibrahim, and my uh, dear colleague, Dr. Sanam Marichova, uh, Associate Consultant and Anesthesiologist, Hamad Medical Corporate Qatar. Um, so, starting, please allow me to welcome and introduce our eminent Professor Samir Al Ansari. Uh, professor of Intensive Care Medicine uh, in Shams University. Actually, uh, words are not enough to introduce Professor Samir. He's a legend in his field already. Uh, tonight, he's kind enough to share uh, his knowledge and experience and shed some light on the uh, topic of the hour, the post-COVID syndrome. Professor Samir, please go ahead. First, thank you, Dr. Rabat, for your nice uh, introduction. Uh, good evening, my colleague. Good evening, our attendees. Uh, today, uh, I am going to continue my topic about uh, speaking about uh, or talking about COVID-19 or COVID syndrome. And today, we will con uh, concentrate on post-COVID uh, syndrome. Really, as we know, COVID syndrome is a multi-system disease, and that affects many, many of the system in the body, as we know. And most of the research in the last months or in the previous months concentrate on the pathology, uh, the modes of transmission, uh, complications, and that. But they uh, try now or proceeding now to concentrate on an imp important topic, which is the post-COVID syndrome or the symptoms and the complications which the patient started to suffering uh, for a period of time or for even uh, several months after uh, recovery from the COVID disease. And so it is not a simple disease like flu and most viral infections and pneumonia and so on. We know, all of us know, we sometimes suffering from post-infection or post-viral infections from some uh, minor symptoms as uh, fatigue, as infection, as pneumonia, coughing, and so on, but not persisting so, much, uh, so long as occurred here in COVID-19, really. Uh, COVID uh, syndrome, as I told it, uh, it is a multi-organ uh, system affection and affect most, most of the system of the body, not only the heart or respiratory or kidney disease. Yes, it is concentrated in the respiratory system, but it can affect also other systems. And really there is a variability from individual or from patient to patients in his uh, symptoms and his organs affected. Some, uh, some uh, suffering from mild disease, others suffering from severe and serious disease. It can affect the heart and the blood vessels can lead to myocarditis, can lead to pericarditis, it can lead to some sort of cardiomyopathy or some sort of uh, 
uh, heart failure and sometimes and sometimes thrombotic complications and ischemic complications can occur. Also, it is uh, yes, it is confined mostly to the respiratory system in most of the patients, causing sometimes uh, post-COVID uh, coughing uh, symptoms. Uh, uh, some chest pain uh, may be due to pleurisy, may be due to lung infarctions and other causes. Also it affects the kidney and sometimes people suffering from post-COVID renal problems and renal troubles and even in, they need some sort of support or renal replacement therapy as CRT or dialysis. Uh, liver also affected and some patients and many patients may suffering from persistent high liver enzymes due to affection of the virus on the cells of the liver. The brain also may affect it and the patient may complain from some neurological complications like uh, fatigue, which is very common, like uh, uh, dizziness, uh, cognitive dysfunction, depression, and anxiety, and so on. The digestive system also affected and many patients, especially the elderly patients, elderly patients may suffering from digestive signs and symptoms like intolerance to food and uh, diarrhea and so on. And uh, we define we define the post acute COVID nineteen as extending beyond three weeks, the acute one, the chronic one, which extend beyond twelve weeks. Broadly speaking, such patients can be divided into those who may suffering from uh, serious sequela, like thromboembolic uh, complications and uh, as pulmonary embolism and uh, ischemic heart, and and the, those patient or those sectors need admission to the hospital for management. But the other one who suffering from non-specific clinical picture, uh, like the headache, fatigue, uh, insomnia, uh, uh, loss of uh, smell, uh, other symptoms, they can be managed in the home with supportive uh, care. Uh, I think there are many theories to explain the post COVID-19. It may be kicking the, kicking the immune system and uh, getting overdrive of the immune system, which you can explain, or it may be extensive inflammation or some sort of hypoxia, which can cause, or thromboembolic or microsomby affecting these organs. The big question is really which most of the study ask now and to concentrate for its research, how long will be the symptoms last? And till now, really, we don't know. And it vary from person to person or, or from patient to patient. What are the post viral syndrome? Of course, we suffering from some sort of uh, uh, minor uh, symptoms after flu, uh, infection or after influenza in general, and for sometimes for months, as is clear, in infectious uh, mononucleosis and other diseases, other viral infections, but not lasting so long as occur in COVID-19. And what, uh, what are we seeing with coronavirus? Coronavirus affect mostly from, uh, for, uh, the range may be very from 10% up to 80% in some studies which lead to post-COVID symptoms, which can persist for or could persist for a few months up to six, seven months in some patients. Uh, why are some people affected and not others? Persistent may be due to uh, multiple causes, maybe persistent viremia, maybe reinfection or relapse, or maybe extensive inflammatory state or other immune reactions or deconditioning to the disease and the mental factors in such patients which are very common because of an anxiety and the depression and post infection stress syndrome and so on. And I think there is a recent theory now which I will explain which is mast cell activations or mastosis which is common in such patients. What are the tests which must be required for those patients suffering from post-COVID? We have to exclude any anemia, which may cause some fatigue or dizziness or shortness of breath. Also, we, can, we have to exclude lymphopenia or elevated, bi elevated biomarkers like C-reactive protein give us idea about the acute infections or uh, bacterial infection. White cell count, if increased, may be inflammatory response. Also, natriuretic peptide is important to exclude heart failure for, uh, or congestion in the heart. Ferritin may uh, give me idea about the uh, state of thrombotic state, which is very common in uh, 
COVID-19. Troponin also will give us idea about the acute coronary syndrome or myocarditis, especially in those who are suffering from chest pain. The dimer may give me an idea about the thromboembolic uh, diseases and uh, I have to uh, anticoagulate. Hot tests are required also. Troponin and the D-dimer test may be falsely positive, but a negative result can reduce the clinical uncertainty. Uh, also, in some patients, we have to proceed to make X, uh, chest X-ray, and if we suspect some problem or persistent uh, complications, we have to subject the patient to CT and the other invasive maneuver, which really we dislike to perform in such a patient to avoid cross-infection and so on. For those with evidence of lung damage, such as persistent abnormal chest X-ray, we have to subject the patient to more investigations, of course. Fever is a common post-COVID-19 symptoms, for example, it may be treated symptomatically with barastamol or any anti, anti uh, uh, with any drug to lowering the temperatures or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Uh, cough, chronic cough also may be due to pleurisy or chest infections or more inflammation in the lung and simple breathing control exercise is very important in such situations and especially the diaphragmatic breathing are very important and in some patients may suffering from reflux which, may cause, which is the underlying cause, we have to give proton blockers or some antacid to avoid this complication. Breathing technique is very important such as diaphragmatic breathing which is uh, increasing the using of diaphragm or by through uh, breathing exercise, uh, uh, using uh, the abdominal muscles and bursted lip breathing it is some sort of yoga technique to allow to train the patient to return back to the normal scenario of breathing. Fatigue is very common in such patients really in post-COVID and the profound and the prolonged nature of fatigue and some post-acute COVID-19 shared features with chronic fatigue syndrome, which may occur after uh, any, uh, any infection or after uh, some viral infections. And do we saw these symptoms commonly seen with SARS and with MERS also, uh, coronavirus, and the commonly acquired, uh, community acquired pneumonia. Some patients may suffer for a long time from fatigue, but not, I think, not extending beyond the three, two, three months in most of the patients. But in Corona, in Corona or on COVID, uh, COVID-19 may persist for longer time. Uh, and so sometimes we ask if COVID-19 is going to be a trigger for myalgic encephalomyelitis or, or with consequent chronic fatigue syndrome, it is, it is often uh, triggered by an infectious uh, diseases. Uh, and I think it needs causing some uh, sort of uh, fatigue, uh, severe fatigue and uh, uh, chronic pain, and uh, it may be managed by gradual and uh, uh, soothing exercise, which may ameliorate it. Uh, graded exercise in chronic fatigue generally, and in COVID-19 in particular, should be undertaken cautiously. We have to avoid excessive, uh, excessive exercise, and the cut back if the patient develops fever or breathlessness or severe fatigue or muscle ache. Uh, uh, also, uh, loss of smell. Some patients suffering from persistence loss of smell and persisting in some people after the acute phase of illness. And the virus, as we know, can be transmitted to the brain or conducted or attack the olfactory nerve and affect the brain. Use of pulse oximetry in post-acute COVID-19 is very important, especially uh, in patients suffering from breathlessness or from dyspnea hypoxia and may be, may be asymptomatic in such a patient, but just with minor exercise, the patient suffering from some sort of hypoxia. And so it is essential to measure the oximetry or apply oximetry in whom uh, for such patients to detect the silent hypoxia or exertional hypoxia. Uh, an exertion desaturation test is very important, just subjects the patient to one minute or two minute exercise. And so if the oximetry or the oximeter reading will drop, if dropped more than 3%, I think he needs some assessment. Fall of 3% in the saturation reading on mild exertion is abnormal and require investigation. 
the British thoracic society guidelines define the target range for oxygen saturation as 94 to 98% and a level of 92% or below as requiring supplementary oxygen unless the patient is in chronic respiratory failure. Uh, oximeter reading persistent in the range of 94 to 95% range or below, I think, require assessment and investigation. Uh, appreciate adjustment should be made for patient with lung disease. Of course, patient who is suffering from lung disease or COPD, the normal range will be accepted, which is 88 to 92%. This is the normal range for such uh, patients. The uh, sports uh, person or the uh, for managing the patient who is uh, who need to to return back to his exercise after recovery from uh, from mild illness, uh, one week uh, of low level of just stretching and strengthening his muscles before targeted cardiovascular sessions, he must avoid or must avoid the excessive exercise. Very mild symptoms, limit activity to slow walking or equivalent, increase rest periods of if symptoms uh, becoming worsen, avoid high intensity training. Uh, persistent symptoms such as fatigue, cough, uh, breathlessness, and fever limit activity to 60% of maximum heart rate till two, three weeks after the symptoms resolve. Uh, social and the culture considerations are very important in post COVID, uh, post acute COVID syndrome, really because, uh, because, as we know, most of the people are staying alone and most of them losing, some losing their job and they may suffering from poverty or from, uh, uh, <coughs> from uh, underlying disease and so on. And so they need even social support through uh, online or through group or through family and so on. And many of the comorbidity, including diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, or ischemic heart disease may be occurred and may be the underlying disease host, which may exaggerate the uh, post-COVID uh, symptoms, which we must search for it. Cardiopulmonary complications also may, the patient may be suffering from acute involvement and may be even commoner and uh, such as myocardial infarction, myocarditis, pericarditis, dysrhythmia, pulmonary embolism. They may present several weeks after acute COVID-19. Chest pain is common in such patients and this is a common suffering symptoms and the clinical priority is, uh, it is important to differentiate between the musculoskeletal and the other non-specific chest pain uh, symptoms. Musculoskeletal is like myositis or some sort of chondritis or uh, uh, any problem of esophagitis. All this can cause chest pain and we have to differentiate between it and between the simple symptoms of post-COVID-19. Uh, chest pain, uh, if persist and severe, we have to subject the patient to uh, more investigation, echo, um, uh, CT, MRI, and so on. Thromboembolism, uh, as we know, this is a common symptom, a common complaint or common problem in the COVID-19. And we speak and we talk in the last uh, previous lectures about the importance of uh, thromboprophylaxis in such patients and the treatment in patients suffering from uh, thromboembolism. Uh, thromboembolism, it is not known really till now through many studies how long the patient will remain hypercoagulable followable, uh, following acute COVID-19. And so the prophylaxis mostly extend after even after the charge from the hospital to uh, one, two or three months according to the uh, case presentation. Uh, ventricular dysfunction, the left ventricular systolic dysfunction and heart failure after COVID-19 can be managed according to standard guidelines also. It's the same scenario. Post-COVID digestive system, the patient may suffering from some problems so in GIT from uh, malabsorptions or some inflammation or diarrhea and even gastrointestinal bleeding have been observed in such patients. 
Neurological sequelae as ischemic stroke, seizures, encephalitis, and the cranial uh, neuropathy have been described after COVID, and these all seem to be rare. Fatigue and depressedness and muscle pain and so on include headache, deadness, cognitive uh, planting, brain fog, all these symptoms, uh, many patients complaining of it after uh, suffering from COVID. Uh, COVID-19 may even cause temporary Barry syndrome, like other viral infections, or even from vaccinations, the patient may develop uh, uh, Barry syndrome after uh, that. Also, some patients may complain from Parkinsonism or Alzheimer's disease in some patients. The older patient really is subjected to more complications because most of the time he is depressed, uh, he is uh, suffering from delirium, suffering from malnutrition, and post COVID-19, uh, chronic pain may affect patient of any age, but has been commoner in the elderly patient. Mental health and well-being, post-traumatic stress as both trauma or post ICU stress syndrome or post-infection syndrome, I think it occurs in any disease, but it is more common here in COVID-19, more, uh, uh, more <coughs> common than other uh, diseases. Your patients start suffering from low mood, the hopelessness, uh, and anxiety, difficulty in, sleep, in sleeping, insomnia, and disturbed sleep, and so both the COVID kidney disease also is uh, the virus can affect the kidney tissue and uh, maybe the cytokine storm and, and the extended inflammation and the microsrombi may affect the uh, renal tissue and also can affect the liver tissue and can the patient may be suffering from resistance uh, complaining from such uh, diseases and even it is higher in uh, the male uh, patient. Uh, there are many studies now about COVID-19 and its mimic or its relationship to mast cell activation syndrome, which is a common study and very important really. And they found that COVID-19 hyperinflammation consistent with mast cell driven inflammation. And the prevalence of severe COVID-19 is similar to that of mast cell activation syndrome, which is common, may be induced, the mast cell may be induced, becoming dysfunctional or increased and activated by the COVID virus. Drug inhibit, they found that the drug inhibiting the mast cells and their mediators, as we know, mast cells, it is responsible for the allergy manifestations. And the mast cells can deliver more than 1,000 mediator leukotrienes, eucosonides, leukotrienes, uh, prostaglandins, and, and many, many uh, mediators which can give the cytokine storm, which we are so in COVID-19. And, and so many studies now prove that there is a, 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 an intact relation between COVID-19 and mast cell activation. And these are symptoms in the mast cell activation syndrome we see most of these symptoms are parallel with those uh, discovered in COVID-19 patients. Where the patient may be suffering from fatigue, fever, conjunctivitis, rhinitis, headache, dyspepsia, heartburn, elevated transaminases, lymphadenopathy, flash, uh, myalgia, uh, arthralgia, edema, and, and all these symptoms we can find in COVID-19. And these symptoms are characteristic to mastosis or mast cell activation syndrome. Uh, and so if we use mast cell stabilizers such as antihistamine, chromelin, and uh, we can prevent the significant increase in post-COVID-19 illness, and which is significant in proportion of such patients, may be driven by chronic persistent mast cell activation. And so there is a, a high correlation between mastosis or mast cell activation syndrome and the COVID-19, both causing this some sort of hyperinflammation. Other drugs or classes which can ameliorate these symptoms or, or which can improve the mast sources as chromelin, flavonoid, leukotriene inhibitors, uh, JAK inhibitors, dexamethasone or steroids, low dose naltrexone, uh, quercetin, uh, ascorbic acid, all used in mast cell or mastosis and also could be used in COVID-19 and give good results. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Samir. That was very informative. Um, I've got some questions for you. So uh, the first question uh, from Amr Subhi. 
um, is the uh, prolonged use of steroids, um, I mean, the prolonged use of steroids, does it have a role uh, to attenuate this syndrome? Of course, of course. Steroids and attenuate this syndrome. I will use steroids in the stage of hyperinflammation of such patients. And okay. even after, and even in the post COVID uh, syndrome symptoms could be ameliorated by steroids. If we don't, sometimes you use anti, anti mass cells uh, antagonist. Uh, uh, but uh, steroids has uh, is uh, a cheap and has a rule, of course, in such a situation. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, how long uh, we need to keep um, I don't know, patients on anticoagulants uh, post COVID uh, during their ICU stay? Really, in the average, for the, the, the high risk patients suffering from thrombotic complication or high risk for DVT and so on, we can extend to three months or even six months. But till now, really, till now, most of the studies differ in the durations and do not prove that for how long the gross thrombotic state of the COVID can persist. All right, thank you. Um, next question, um, which of the uh, post COVID-19 problems uh, is reversible? What? Which of the post COVID-19 problems is reversible, which of them, which one of them? Most of these symptoms are reversible, most of these symptoms, but in, so, in some patients, in minority of patients, it can persist for a long time. Yeah, and even, uh, for example, insomnia, uh, for example, the uh, loss of uh, smell can persist for eight months, nine months in some patients. Most so, of them yeah. may be ameliorated by time and improved by time, but it takes a long time in some patients. Okay, so um, but, uh, but there are some, of course, some symptoms which are due to underlying uh, problem, underlying pathology, which, which need more investigation and more treatment. Suppose uh, so a patient suffering from coughing due to pleurisy or some lung infections, which due to maybe bacterial infection or pneumonia, you need treat uh, treatment. Some problems like uh, CNS problem or neurological problems can persist or not uh, could be uh, could not be ameliorated by treatment, such as uh, Alzheimer, such as uh, severe uh, headache, maybe due to some sort of uh, encephalitis. Uh, all of this can persist for a long time. There is syndrome in some patients which follow viral infection and they specifically can follow the COVID-19 can persist for a long time and others may be relieved rapidly. According to, there is individual in the COVID, there is individual variability really, enter individual variability, very common in such patients. Okay, thank you for that. Um, another question, how to manage a patient uh, undergoing cesarean section uh, um, with a history of COVID-19 for two weeks with no anticoagulant cover and no other medical disorders? You, 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 for anticoagulation of such patients, you have to follow the as, a, as a routine as the patients are not uh, suffering from COVID. You have to take, give them the prophylactic dose. You have to give the after treatment, after cesarean dose, and so on. And of course, consider the operation and the bleeding tender and the bleeding problem, and so on. But okay. it is, but it is managed after cesarean as a high as a high risk patients. You need continue. Uh, we have to continue the anticoagulation, prophylactic anticoagulation. Prophylactic anticoagulations may be range from one milligram of enoxaparin or low molecular weight heparin, subcutaneous BRKG, just prophylactic dose. And really most of the studies now uh, not finding any difference between in the prognosis between the prophylactic and the therapeutic doses. And so depend mostly on prophylactic, except in patient accepting so, uh, uh, thromboembolic disease as pulmonary embolism or DVT established already, we have to give the therapeutic dose for such patient. Okay. Uh, one of the questions is that, would you recommend to have special clinics to follow up such patients? It is common now in, in, in many hospitals all over the world. Okay. And how would you make a proper differential diagnosis for such cases? Uh, from the uh, from the history, it is a normal scenario. But if the symptom persists, we have to under uh, search do to search for the underlying cause, maybe an oculate uh, 
causes uh, not as suffering from uh, breezelessness or shortness of breath, maybe just a sequel from uh, uh, from COVID due to some uh, relative, uh, relative hypoxemia or in just need oxygen therapy or may need some investigation, maybe underlying disease, underlying cardiac disease. We have to search for if the symptom persists. All right. Uh, another question uh, from the Facebook. Uh, when should I discharge a patient without uh, fearing that he would deteriorate at home? Uh, uh, if the patient is not uh, in need for oxygen therapy, if the patient is not suffering from uh, uh, DVT, from uh, pulmonary emboli, from the major complications which need intervention, we can, of course, uh, transfer him to home. This is a, a, the, the ordinary uh, So the patient to not needing, uh, not in need for invasive uh, maneuver, uh, we can discharge him. Right. Uh, another question regards the steroids. Um, the colleague says that steroids will cause immunosuppression and would that be of help in such a viral infection? But the main problem now is the high cytokine storm and the yeah. hyperinflammation. That's we true. have two balances between the, the two, but uh, in such patients really, really now we, while we are treating uh, COVID-19, we remember uh, MERS syndrome, MERS, uh, and SARS syndrome and H1N1 at that time. And we lost many patients at that time, really, because we not concentrate on the hyperinflammatory state and the prosrhombotic state, which mm. I am sure such patients are uh, suffering from it. Any viral inflammation causing hyperinflammation. But the extent of the inflammatory state may, be, may, be, may differ from uh, Highly severe in COVID-19, maybe less severe in MERS and SARS. But in general, in coronavirus, it is the hyperinflammatory state or the cytokine storm or the mass cell hyperactivation is the underlying main underlying cause, not the virus, not the infection itself. I think the hyperinflammatory state and the and the consequence, the prothrombotic and thrombotic complication are the main problems. Thank you very much, Professor Samir. Actually, I'm still getting loads of questions, but I believe we should be moving onwards because of the uh, time factor.